for him trade unionism meant more than what it seems to imply today. And, and, and one of his great significance was linking up trade union work with something which we'll look at in a minute. Now this was in 1935. Uh, if you can imagine a society where the strongest uh, power in the world, um, equivalent probably to the USA today, uh, controlling a whole colonial and so-called empire, how do you struggle against an institution like that? Um, but anyway, this is what uh, Maka Singh and others tried to do. And his m method was through the trade union movement, working with the working class people. I think what is easily forgotten is the issue around class. Colonialism worked through classes. It created a new class to be its torchbearers, who are still around us today. Uh, but Maka Singh was on the other side, working with the workers. Um, and he, he was elected the secretary of the Indian Trade Union. I think, again, it's, 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 it's important to recognize that strikes and working class struggles did not start with Mark and Singh. I think in his book, he talks about the very first strike in 1898 or something like that, the Railway Workers Union. Workers were on strike. So strike and worker organizations have been there throughout the colonial period. But Mark and Singh directed in a particular way, he laid the foundation of a radical movement. But he was active right from 35 onwards. Now you can imagine, even today, to go and strike the teachers or whoever, find it difficult to survive without wages. And in those days, um, to think that the workers went on strike <coughs> for 62 days, how did they survive? Um, and how did they have the strength to go on for such a long time? And I think the answer is partly that they build up links in the communities. The workers, the peasants, who are all supporting it. And it is that solidarity that made it possible for uh, the strike to continue for so long. And it, that strike, I'm trying to write a play based on the events of that time, so one day I'll finish it. But they, they, they won that advance. Uh, part of it was a 15 to 25% increase in salary, and if I'm not mistaken, I think they were also fighting for an eight-day week, which we now take for granted. Striking a situation like that had, had, I think, an almost electrifying impact in the country, particularly as far as the union's membership was concerned, it started going up, because people, workers saw that Fighting on their own is not possible, and that working together, they can achieve what they want. So, membership went up, and the government, which had up to that time to sort of pretend it does, the unions don't exist, or that they are not powerful, or that they are not important, started recognizing that there is no way they are going to sideline the trade unions. And the significance of that will come later when we talk a bit about more and more. That if unions are now accepted as an institution in a country that has implications for how the history develops later. So the, the trade union ordinance was passed in 1937 and the union was registered in 1937. And by 1948, 16 trade unions affiliated to the Labour Trade Union of East Africa with a membership of 10,000 workers. Now it's a huge number, and 1948 is really just uh, after the war. You can imagine the power that the Union had in those days. And, and the other side of the power was the weakness of the colonial setup, that they, they could not suppress the trade union movement with all their, I don't know, resources from around the world. In a sense, he, he was forced to go to India, but then he studied working class conditions in trade unionism. So he wasn't there to sort of go and start a business and start like, importing or exporting, I don't know, things. He, he was a serious activist. He was, was started working with the workers and understanding the trade union movement. He was active in India's 
Freedom Struggle and he addressed mass meetings of 30,000 Bombay workers and strikers in 1939 and attended the Indian National Congress as an African delegate. But we come back to Kenya in 1947, he's back and uh, the sort of some of the things he was interested in or involved in was thinking about some of the issues facing the first the South Asian community. And he was, th that community has been and was divided among castes and races and I don't know, all sorts of different bits and pieces. Um, but he was talking about sort of a, having a united front of workers from the uh, South Asian communities. And if, if he sort of advocated unity among South Asians, but not only among themselves, a little group sitting marginalized in the program. He was very much that their group should work with the Africans for democratic advance. He, he fought to establish a democratic government with equal franchise and adult suffrage. 1947, nobody would, uh, th would have thought that even possible. And to organize joint friends of different workers from different uh, backgrounds, including African, Asian, and an age thing also, youth leagues and so on. He advocated establishing common high schools because one of the ways to make people get divided is by going through different streams of schooling. Um, I went to city primary school in Nairobi, which was an Asian thing that was in the 50s. Uh, but what he was advocating was common schools where people can, communities can learn from each other and also the importance of Kiswahili is the language. Very quickly jumping over a few years, Kenya Youth Conference, East Africa and India. So he was active not only in one thing, he was politically active in various things happening around him. And in 49, he and uh, Fred Kubai organized the East African Trade Union Congress with Fred Kubai as the Secretary General. Again, Fred Kubai Bilkat Kagia and a lot of other people have been marginalized in Kenyan history. And I think the crucial sort of a date comes in <coughs> 1950, 23rd April. He called for complete independence for East Africa, not just Kenya, for East Africa at a mass meeting of Kenya African Union and East African Indian National Congress. So already here you see <coughs> the different communities working together. Uh, but it was the first time that anybody talked about complete independence. Uh, and, and that was something that the colonial authorities found, I uh, think, terrible. And I think somewhere I wrote that by saying that he embarrassed lots of sort of so-called political leaders also, that none of them had dared to talk about independence. And of course, the consequences were to follow. You, you don't make a statement like that uh, in a mass meeting where there are hundreds of people and you don't sort of get away with it where the colonial authorities see the threat of what that one statement stands for. Not only the statement, but what Markin Singh himself represented. The accusation against him was that Markin Singh published articles in the press. I think pre press and Markin Singh are very important in the importance of uh, communication. And, and in fact, communication from the working class, from the workers, how do you communicate? And the trade unions in those days did not have the internet and so on. So they would sort of have people on bicycles uh, ringing bells in the various residences and saying, oh, there is a meeting taking place uh, or distributing printed hand, uh, handbills. Because there was no radio station they could use, there were no newspapers they could use. They devised their own system of communication. Disseminated pamphlets and repeatedly addressed. Now, this was an accusation talking not only to the Asian communities but to the African communities, which, is dangerous, which was dangerous. That secret plans were being hatched to take over African land. Now, this, this was no secret really, but somebody articulating it makes it dangerous for him. So, from 50 to 62, he remains in the background. But 
the movement and what he had started, he and the trade union movement had started working with the political situation, which we'll see in a minute, that changed the situation between 1950 and 1962. The pressure continued building and, and the pressure cooker was sort of blowing up almost. And that is what forced the colonists to at last uh, release Mackensen unconditionally. Because he refused to give in, but by 1961, he, he, they had to release him. And then again, he was not sort of somebody who was saying, okay, now I'm out, I can sit and eat parties or whatever people do when they are released from detention. He caught by writing to trade union activities. You know, the laws, were, the colonial laws were entrenched, and uh, even in the, so the publishing, that is under the colonialism, uh, more and more could publish, I don't know, something like 50 newspapers in different forms and guises. After independence, to publish a newspaper, you have to pay, I don't know, 10,000 or I don't know, some lots of shillings. And that became impossible to communicate uh, uh, another, another alternative ideology or way of organizing societies. So, in fact, the, the transition to neocolonialism ensured that the lessons of the that the British colonialism learned in suppressing working class interests were entrenched in new rules and regulations. What I want to go next into, to, uh, not me to talk about Mackensen, but to let Mackensen himself talk. Because uh, he has been writing and reading and doing so many things, it's a shame not to sort of let him speak for himself. He doesn't have interpreters like us, like me. So what is he saying is, Kenya's trade union movement, now this linking trade union movement with other things, has always been a part of a national struggle for resisting British imperialist colonial rule, for winning national independence, for consolidating the independence after winning it, and for bringing prosperity to the workers and people of Kenya. And that is a crucial sort of a thing that a trade union, in a, in, in a clear sense, like even in Britain, you find the teachers going on strike, or you find the you know, health workers going on strike, and, 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 and that is it. I mean, you're looking at that one little thing. The political power which decides what workers get or don't get is kept hidden in some bank worlds. You don't see it, and the trade union is being channeled, like some of these rivers you see, being channeled to go into that direction only. Whereas for Mackensen, the important thing was linking up with the national struggle for resistance. And this one comes from his book, History of Kenya's Trade Union Movement to 1952. This is not only in Kenya, this is in Britain, it's in the USA. I think it's a worldwide conspiracy against workers. The whole so called economic crisis is created to take away power, wealth, and resources from the working classes to those few top rich guys. So the class issue is an important one. And here is uh, again another quote. And this was in the context of Nairobi becoming a city. And he says there are two Nairobis, that of the rich and that of the poor. The status of the latter has not changed. Celebration, they were celebrating in Nairobi getting a city status and I remember getting this uh, city pipi we used to call them those uh, rock, Nairobi rock. Very nice and very, very, very sweet uh, as a child. Uh, we, we didn't understand the politics of it. We didn't understand what Nairobi was. But we loved those sweets. The celebration will be justified on the day when this country's government becomes truly democratic, with the workers fully sharing the tasks of government. That um, truly democratic, with workers fully sharing the tasks a government? No, not yet. This is Mackensen at his best, I think. Uh, and that remember that you will be crushed on the heels of capitalists tomorrow if you don't fight today. Workers should have united stand and should stand up strongly against the capitalists so that they should not even have the courage to attempt to exploit the, the language itself, exploit and all. After independence, it will, you will be end up in prison if you use work like capitalists or exploitation, workers' rights. So this was, in a sense, politicizing workers. 
uh, increasing their awareness of the, of the world, it, it explain to them what is the cause of their poverty. It's not that don't get mixed up in fighting each other. There are greater forces understanding those. And then finally, a piece of information, the workers of uh, cuts and leather have gone on strike. So these strikes are going on all the time. They are distributing leaflets. Part of the leaflets was to make the workers understand the reasons behind the strike and, and, and understanding the struggle that has to be waged. But this obviously, I think, shows the influence of Hawkinson himself. And he used, I think, the Kalsa Press also to publish some of these things. Again, another example of a handbill which I copied. Uh, I think I made a copy of it from the archives illegally. Okay, so I can read the rest of I tried to translate it from uh, from Gujarati. It the fuck. Oh, see, is that the word? It the fuck. It the fuck. So it's a victory of unity. Fate, fate. Is that fate? Fate means victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was trying to translate this. Ek time is fate. Yeah. So it's just a rough translation into English, but it might be in incorrect, probably. But I think what we want to think is, look at the languages in which it is published. So it shows that they were trying to bring the workers of different communities together. And, um, and, and in a short little leaflet, which they didn't have sort of millions of pages to, to be able to write, and I think it's such a powerful message about meeting. And that, by the way, was printed in my grandfather's very first Press. Khatsa Press. Khatsa Press. Yes. Uh -huh. So that's another history that needs to be recorded and written or understood. Again, another uh, quote. The heroic resistance of our people of the is a resistance of, of our people, I think it's true, to the onslaughts of the imperialists has ultimately defeated one of the biggest imperialist powers in the world and has won our complete independence. I think that is a crucial uh, legacy that one needs to think about, that uh, you think about trying to defeat USA today. Uh, and then and, and they are controlling our information, our resources, our minds, our communications, and, and you, you end up by having these few mad guys, you could call them, thinking that they could defeat this. But what he says is the resistance of our people, and that is what they were, resistance is important. That, that, is, that is what they're fighting for, and it's what they got. Again, I mean, again, it's only a fact, but not be very known, that the course of his resection, uh, a continued resistance, even in the presence, he wasn't just sitting quietly and praying to God, okay, oh, they really let me out of He was resisting, and he, he gives examples of he went on three hunger strikes, one for 10 days, 12 days, and 21 days, 52, 59, and 61. And, and, and that's, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm trying to recall this thing. And this is just, an, uh, we mentioned the working class, the strike in 1937, but this is, this is what it looked like in those days. I don't know, you know that in Jardine or something, I've seen it somewhere, or at least I used to see it. But all this 25% increase, at that particular time, there's some disapproval from the leaflet. Uh, this uh, scary sort of <laughs> keeping an eye on them. And this, if you look at them, they sort of say, I work as I can be, I don't work there. And look sort of very weak and powerless kind of a thing, wearing dhotis or to the other thing. And yet there was power in that. And I think these kind of images need to be sort of recaptured. By the way, mm -hmm. that's the year I was born in. Oh, seven. Oh, well. So the strike started. I see any of them. And so one of the people who father was organizing this. Probably. <laughs> Busy doing what the body called in the area. But really, if you think about it, behind the scenes, the manipulation has increased to such an extent that the news distortion of history, misinformation, disappearing not only of individuals but progressive ideas, actions and people. That is the rule of the, of the, of the, of the game, the rule of the day. Um, anything progressive is hidden and, and what we get, and, and, and I think a very interesting example in, in Britain is the BBC. 
I put my taxes there, which runs the BBC. And all it can do is uh, talk about the uh, royal baby or something for days and days and days. Uh, all it can do, and this was something I read recently somewhere, that it gave um, a fact, so-called fact, that Mugabe has killed 10,000 people during, I think, the last elections or something. So that inter misinterpretation, uh, the whole wars being waged uh, in, in Iraq with weapons of mass destructions, where are they? So we are being told what to think, how to think, and if you challenge that, then you are sure I'm like you end up in Guantanamo uh, prison or something. So Markham Singh, if you talk about Markham Singh, you're talking about working class, you're talking about strikes, you're talking about struggles, linking up with politics. Oh no, that, that can't be allowed. So forget about this history. And that rule, that uh, the way it is done, it's not just them sitting in London and New York and Paris. It's in, in Nairobi also. Uh, that, that suppression takes place. Who decides on syllabus in, in universities and schools? Who decides what to be taught to our children? It is not that they make it a desert from all over the world, but ultimately it's a political decision made by so-called leaders in Kenya. And uh, Makesing not only to go, uh, was active in uh, working class struggles, but in recording that struggle. You see, if it's not recorded, it is lost. What Israel does today in, in Palestinian lands is destroys the streets, buildings. So if anybody comes from outside, they, say, they can't say I lived here. Because the geography, they're changing the geography. Uh, but if it's not recorded, it's lost forever. That is, I think, great contribution. is not only in his struggle, but in his recording of history. And he was always saw so communication is uh, important. And he saw that mass action, division were essential. And that Markinson's example was too dangerous, and it still is too dangerous, to imperialism. Hence, suppress it. He was marginalized when he came out of detention. They could, they could not physically kill him, or maybe they could, I don't know, they didn't. But they isolated him, then they used the people in power at that time to marginalize him so that his contribution could not be seen or could not be continued. And what imperialism wanted was to divide people into uh, tribal units, it wanted resistance to be disorganized, leaderless, and without an ideology, to separate trade unions from the freedom struggle, obscure, obscure class struggle to create strife among working people. And it's all these things that Mark can say in the trade union person chase here. Uh, those are the things that Marcus Singh and the trade unions fought against. So the question was, why do we not know more about him? And this is some of the reasons. Now the crucial, crucial thing uh, was linking economic and political struggles. And I'll quote a few people. This one is from uh, Fred Kubai, from the foreword to his book, Markin Singh's own book. And he says, some people believe the trade unions in those days were not trade unions at all, because they were politically informed. Politics is a dirty word here and not confined to industrial collective bargaining. And that was the very strength of the trade unions in those days, and that is what Makin Singh said, ensured was at the center of it, it, not just fighting these local little battles. Uh, this one is again from uh, same 